Hey guys, so in our last lessons we were looking at whether the molecules are polar or not based on its shape. And now we're going to look at whether the shape of the molecule is going to affect physical properties. So we can see the shape of the molecule by, looking, by remembering back to our VSEPR theory. So whether they're going to be bent shape or in methane it's going to be tetrahedral or not and ammonia going to be pyramidal. And then this can determine whether it's going to be polar or not and therefore we can look at physical properties based on that. So physical properties, can you remember what they are? It's, it's some things like melting point and boiling point, so it's mainly due to forces between molecules, not within the molecules. So if you look at this table here, it's just got uh, four sets of molecules, their mass in grams per mole, and then we're looking at the melting point and boiling point based on the mass. Uh, so melting and boiling points of water are considerably higher than other molecules. So in here we can see the melting point is zero and the boiling point is 100. But then if we look at similar, like similar size molecules, so about four atoms in each one, um, we can see that they're in the minus range uh, in degrees Celsius. So why is it that water is, has such a high melting and boiling point? So that's what we'll be answering today. So this is unexpected because we, when we increase the molecular weight, um, it leads to generally an increase in the boiling point and melting point. But in this case, it's not the case. It's not true. Uh, so in the, in the uh, sorry in the hydrocarbons, we can see that if we increase the molecular weight down here, uh, we get an increase in melting point. So from a very low negative temperature to a very high, well not very high, but still a positive. Uh, temperature. So it, it happens in both cases, so the melting point and the boiling point. So the general trend is that when we increase the weight, we're going to increase the melting point and the boiling point temperatures. Uh, but in the one we showed before with the water and hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen sulfide is the heaviest of the three listed and we expect that to be the, have the highest melting and boiling point based on what we saw with the hydrocarbons. But this wasn't true. So why is it? Why is it that you know water being quite light, having such a high melting point and boiling point, and hydrogen sulfide being the heaviest, having quite a low melting and boiling point? Not the lowest, because methane is, but still quite considerably lower compared to water. So what is it? There must be something else involved other than the weight. Uh, so just looking at that, we know we can see that water is 18. Hydrogen sulfide is almost, it's more than double. So, uh, what what else is involved other than the atoms and the weight of it? Uh, we know that water is a very polar molecule. It's the most polar molecule in the list there. And then methane here is a non-polar molecule. So, can you see why it's polar and non-polar? So, we remember that oxygen is electronegative. It's pulling electrons closer to it in each bond, and therefore the hydrogens are going to be positive on this side and then the oxygen on this side is going to be negative. So it's a polar molecule with the negative side this way. And that means in between molecules, they can bind. Uh, in methane, we have a tetrahedral shape, carbon in the middle, four hydrogens on the, around it, and it's symmetrical. And so that means it's a non-polar molecule. So the degree of polarities between molecules are different between the two. And the polarity of the molecule uh, largely influences the intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are ones between molecules, so between different uh, water molecules, and this is going to determine the physical properties because we need to break these to then either melt it or to evaporate it or boil it. So in summary, we need to look at the shape of the molecule, whether the molecule is polar or not, to determine if it ha what kind of intermolecular forces between molecules and then we can then use this to let us know whether uh, it's going to have a high melting point or a low melting point. So we can look at some questions. Explain why the water molecule is a polar molecule uh, but the carbon dioxide molecule is uh, not polar even though it has polar bonds. So firstly the water molecule is a bent shape we know it's not symmetrical because it's got two lone pairs and it's pushing it into a V shape. 
and that means that each of the OH bonds here, each OH bond is polar because remember negative, electronegative, not electronegative, pulling electrons closer to it. Uh, so the dipoles don't cancel out because we're adding two similar direction ones, net dipole this way, so negative on this side, positive on this side. So that molecule is going to be polar. Uh, carbon dioxide is linear, remember, no no lone pairs, so it's going to have oxygen here pulling electrons closer to it, oxygen on this side pulling electrons closer to it, carbon being a bit more positive. Uh, because it's linear, what does that tell us? It means that the electrons are getting pulled in opposite directions, so it's symmetrical, and so each of the dipoles are getting cancelled out because pulling out in, dif uh, in opposite directions. So this molecule is nonpolar. So for it to be polar, it needed it to be not symmetrical. So question 13, explain the unusually high melting and boiling point of water in terms of intermolecular forces. So remember intermolecular forces are between molecules, not within them. So why has it got a high melting and boiling point? So water molecules have quite a few different types of forces involving uh, between molecules. So there's dispersion forces, so they're quite weak. We have dipole-dipole forces because remember the pole, uh, each bond is a dipole. And then we have hydrogen bonds because there's lone pairs on the oxygen. So this makes the water molecule uh, polar and quite strong because of hydrogen bonds being present. So uh, we, to separate it we need to break these into molecular bonds. So when we melt something, the, the lattice structure of ice, the water molecules uh, have lots of strong bonds between them, we need to break it to melt it and then it becomes water. When we have water and we want to boil it, we need to break those bonds again to make, sh make it evaporate and become a gas. So because the hydrogen bonds are so strong, uh, it has an unusually high melting and boiling point because we need to put so much heat in there to make it a, a change state. So explain why molecules of water and hydrogen sulfide have the same shape. So we need to look at first the Lewis dot structure, do they have lone pairs or not? In this case they do. So when we do the electron dot structure we can, we can find that out. Uh, we know that there's four pairs of electrons around the central atom. These uh, electron pairs repel each other, they're all negative, repelling each other, form a tetrahedral arrangement around the atom. Uh, but the shape of the molecule is dis decided by the atoms, not the lone pairs. So we know that there's only three atoms in there, so the central atom, two other atoms on each side, and then two sets of lone pairs. So the lone pairs are going to push the atoms down, making it into a V shape, as we learnt before. So question 15, which of the two compounds has the largest intermolecular force? Uh, just the fire answer. So intermolecular forces, remember, between molecules. So we need to input energy, so usually that's in the form of heat, to break these uh, bonds between them and then we can then change state of the, of the compound. So in this case we're looking at melting point, so we're changing it from a solid to a liquid and we can see that water is zero, ammonia is minus 78. Um, so based on this we can say that water has the largest intermolecular force because we need more energy compared to this one. And then so when we put uh, more energy, that means we're going to break the bonds uh, between them and therefore we're going to uh, change state from a solid to a liquid and because ammonia is such a low melting point, we can say it has low intermolecular f uh, forces. Uh, so for covalent mo molecular compounds, to change state we need to break the intermolecular forces so they can move apart. And the water has the highest melting point and boiling points, so it needs the most energy put into it to break the intermolecular forces. So this one is the strongest one and ammonia is going to be the, the weaker one. So next question is question 16. Order the substances in terms of increasing strength of the intermolecular forces. So we can look at the boiling points. The boiling points tell us how much energy we need to put in to break intermolecular forces. So the lowest one here is going to be CH4, it needs the least amount of um, energy put into it and water going to be the most. So we can say that 
CH4 is going to be the first one. And then what's the next lowest one? NH3. And then the next lowest is SO2. And finally, water is the highest, being needing the most amount of heat energy. So just to recap, we know that the shape is important, bonds are polar or not, and therefore that's important in determining overall uh, polarity of the molecule. Then the polarity of the molecule can tell us whether or not it's going to have strong intermolecular forces, so between, ad, uh, between molecules. And uh, if, if it doesn't, then it's going to be weak, it's going to have low melting and boiling points. If it's strong like water, it's going to have high melting and boiling points. Thank you.